Good evening, everybody. Good to, good to see you. Uh, we are studying, of course, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and each of us is given different assignments. Uh, I got the first assignment because nobody wanted to tackle all the Beatitudes in one day, and that's okay. We got through them and enjoyed it. Uh, it's a fast-moving study, but we enjoyed it. Tonight, I, I got the one that nobody wanted to do because they, they didn't quite know how to handle it. Judge not. Uh, that you be not judged. So we're in Matthew chapter 7. As we look at this, let's first, we're going to read and then come back and probably reread uh, the entire thing. So here, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And when the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or... How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, all six of those verses go together. They fit. It's all talking about judgment. And we want to think about that. First of all, realizing condemning others is wrong. That's what the Lord says. Notice verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In each case, the word judge and judgment literally describes, first of all, condemn and condemnation. So these folks that uh, kind of flippantly just pop off, go to hell. That's really treading in bad territory. You're really going down a road you don't, you don't want to go down uh, because... Uh, that, is, that is you basically condemning someone, and the Lord is going to measure to you just like you measured out. And it's a very serious matter. We've, we've unfortunately allowed society to, to make us uh, a little less sensitive to some things. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I was not alive when it happened, but I did have a, an aunt who just uh, thought Gone with the Wind was the greatest thing the world ever had. She read the book. She saw the movie. There is no telling how many times. You do realize that there is, to my knowledge, one curse word in that movie, and it nearly was banned. That's 1939. Now move to today and tell me if you can even turn your television on and not hear it. It is, it's all the time. Certain radio stations that carry certain types of music. And I, look, everybody's saying, oh, he's talking about hip-hop. Well, okay, hip-hop. What about country? Now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, 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 I, there, are, there are country songs that I like. But how many times do they just, you know, just... Use language, no concern, no interest in it. And if you and I listen to that all the time, I'm going to warn you what's going to happen. We, we get desensitized. And we may end up using it ourselves. Now, we may regret it and immediately apologize for it, but that's what happens. So be careful. But in particular, don't condemn people. Look at Matthew, or excuse me, Luke uh, chapter 18 and we're just going to zero in on verse 11. You remember this story uh, that's going on here. Jesus is telling a parable. It's about two men uh, that go up to the temple to pray. The one is a tax collector, and the other is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were extremely self-righteous. Uh, they thought that they were, they in God's eyes, they could do no wrong and they don't think they did any wrong. That's, why they, that's their view of their lives. So this tax collector uh, has a whole different attitude. And you can see that in, in the parable. And here's 
uh, what he has the Pharisee saying in his prayer. Uh, he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Now just think about the way he, he views life. If you read the entire parable, this, this Pharisee basically says, God, you're really blessed to have me. <laughs> I, I am the man, you know, uh, and, and I know if you didn't have me, you would really be shortchanged. But look around me, God, look at all these bad folk. Well, listen to the parable because you're going to see that that kind of attitude will not work. What about uh, in the church? See, we, we just talked briefly about in the life of Jesus, uh, and the church at that moment is not in existence. So let's look at Romans chapter 14. Some of you guys are going to be teaching this in the very near future. So uh, listen to what he says in verse 4. Who are you to judge another's servant to his own master? He stands or falls. Indeed, he'll be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Think about the way it is. Who is the master of every Christian? Well, it's Jesus Christ. See? So is it my place to judge the, the value or the lack of value in somebody else's service? Paul said, no. He's going to stand or fall with his master. And then he goes a step further. And his master is going to make him stand. Now think about what we read about Jesus and the things that he does for us. You know, one of the quotes that probably a lot of us in here like is Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, it's not, I can't do it myself. But he, he can cause me to do it. Think about Romans chapter 8. When you look at that, think about what he talks about. In verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? God can make you stand. Does that mean that you never committed sin? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means he knows how to deal with it. If you turn to him, if you ask for his help. And so very, very important, I think, that we see that. Look at verses 12 and 13, that same Romans chapter 14. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. All right, first of all, realize one day we'll all be judged by a judge that doesn't miss anything. I'm not going to fool him. You're not going to fool him. He knows everything that you've done and everything that I've done. And that's who we're going to have to face. So instead of me wasting my time trying to judge you in, in a condemning way, talk about how you're lost, things like that, what I need to focus on is helping you stay with the master who can make you perfect who can cause those sins to be taken away. That's basically what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 14. And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, as he talks about love, uh, the Apostle Paul says that love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Here's the problem with the judge. Whoever the judge is, the person that likes to condemn other people, they rejoice in you messing up. That's the way they focus, they function. The greatest thrill in life is to be able to point out your error to you and let you know you lost. You're going to live like that. You lost. Well, better be careful. Because we're warned against condemning others. It's wrong. But then, Jesus goes on to say, consider self first. Now go back, reread verses 3 and 4. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or, 
How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I have a theory. I've never pursued it very far. That the Lord was one of the best teachers using occasionally humor to make you to make you realize a great lesson. I think that's what he's doing here. So here is your friend, your brother in Christ. Your brother in Christ has got something in his eye, and he may be, you know, you can just imagine him. He's rubbing on that eye, he's just desperately trying to get it out. And you come along, and you've got a two-by-four sticking out your eye. It really almost doesn't matter how long it is, does it? Get about five foot long, that's too, too far. I can't reach that far. See? So you've got a two, two-by-four sticking out of your eye, and you say to your brother, here, let me help you get that bit of dust out of your eye. That's the image. To me, that's humorous. But it makes a great point, doesn't it? Who should I look at first? I need to look at me. <clears throat> I don't know what your experience is. I can tell you what mine is. You know what I like least in other people? It's what I like least in me. I've caught myself on that occasionally. You know, realize that, well, the reason I don't like him or her doing that is because that's exactly what I do. And I think I ought to be corrected, but hey, it's easier to correct you than it is to correct me. You know, that kind of a thing. That's what's going on. Well, that's kind of what we're dealing with here. You know, we've got to realize that my first priority is taking care of me. My first priority is making sure that I am right in God's eyes. So, Paul, writing to the Corinthian brethren in 2 Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Who am I to examine? Well, it doesn't say examine your friend, your brother over here. It doesn't say that, does it? Examine yourself. What am I looking for? How, what am I examining in my life? What am I testing? And the answer is, I'm testing to see if I'm in, watch it, the faith. Now, a lot of people want to talk, oh, I've got faith. Wait a minute, that's not the point here. When the definite article is in front of the word faith, it's not talking about your faith or my faith. It's talking about the faith. The faith is the sum of all that is believed. Now, <clears throat> I am not going to rob a future teacher's thunder, but in, in a few weeks in this class on Wednesday night, we got a teacher that's going to review the entire Son of the Mount real quick, short order, going to review the whole thing. And you know what you're going to hear as you go through there? You're going to see, I got a lot of examining to do. I got a, look, a lot of looking at me to do. Think about what Jesus has talked about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Have you recognized your spiritual poverty? We need to. I'd say on the day of Pentecost that the, the 3,000 that obeyed the gospel recognized their spiritual poverty. We have crucified the Son of God. Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's self-examination that they're going through. And they're, they discover, of course, they're in no wise in the faith because they've got something to do to obey the gospel and become a part of the faith, the sum of everything they believe. But you can go right on down through the whole Show on the mount, and you're going to see that kind of thing over and over and over again. Check your life by looking at the Sermon on the Mount. See if you are living the Christian life. Examine yourself is the idea. Now, what about this disqualified thing? 
Well, every now and then, uh, this happens. Uh, they, and I take a, th there was a fellow I used to love to watch uh, in the, uh, oh boy, we'll get it right in a second. The bicycle race in uh, the Tour de France. I used to love it. A guy named Lance Armstrong. It's, it's a blast to watch him. Uh, the guy just seemed to have uh, limitless ability, you know, to get past everybody. You know, they took every one of those things away from him. He, he won, I think, four times, something like that. They took all of his victories away from him. Why? Because he was guilty of blood doping, uh, which is, well, ask your favorite doctor and let him tell you what that is. <laughs> I don't fully understand. I know it has something to do with... Be able to get more oxygen in your body. That, that's what a little bit I know. And that may be wrong. But anyway, he's, he's, not, he's not really a champion. He's disqualified. He's the winner, but disqualified. Occasionally that happens in a, in a horse race. You may have seen a race like that. Where the horse that may win it going away is, is uh, caught with drugs. Illegal r drugs for a horse to have. And disqualified, he loses. That's the, that's the idea here. The Apostle Paul has already used that same idea right into these people, and of all things about himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he says, But I discipline my body daily and keep it into subjection, as that by any means, <clears throat> when I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, you've got to kind of understand the games of that day. And by the way, probably not the Olympic games, although they did function the same way. But instead, these would be the Isthmian games. Uh, because Corinth is on the Isthmus of Greece. And that's where they held those games. They held them many, many times. So pa Paul, when he uses this illustration, knows they're going to understand the illustration. By, just before this, he's talked about shadow boxing. <laughs> he said, I'm not, I'm not like somebody that's beating the air. No, no, I'm in a real fight here, is the idea. And then he comes down to this verse 27, and he knows that in the Isthmian games of his day, that before every contest, one contestant would stand up and would announce the rules. Now, I don't know a lot of rules in track and field. There's one I know for sure, though. In the short distance races, like 100 meter, 200 meter, you cannot go out of your lane. I know that. So imagine Hussein Bolt. I know there's now a guy supposedly faster than him, but whatever. I'm old and we'll just use an old guy and talk about him. <clears throat> Hussein Bolt breaks out in the final, breaks out of the, uh, uh, the uh, starting block, and hit, man, he's just blowing them away. I mean blowing them away. He gets down about the, about the 50-meter mark, maybe 75-meter mark, and he starts kind of looking over his shoulder, seeing, and all, you can almost see him you know, grinning and waving at all those guys behind him. But as he grins and waves, he drifts. He still finishes. Finishes way ahead of everybody. Man, he, he at one point was the best of the best. But guess what? If he goes out of his lane, he loses. Doesn't matter who breaks the tape because he violated the rules. Here's Paul. And what has he done? He's come to Corinth, to, to the Isthmus of Greece. And he has announced the rules of the Christian life. He's told the church all about these rules. But he says, I make sure to keep my body under control. And it's kind of interesting. It looks like the image he's using is a metaphor that also comes out of those games. It was their form of wrestling. And it would be different than ours a little bit. Uh, if I understand it correctly, when, uh, when one competitor would get the other one down, he had to hold him for a certain period of time. Not the one, two, three that we do, but what, whatever. Certain length of time. 
And if the other guy started to, to kind of try to get up, why, he'd just punch him, knock him right back down. So here's Paul, and he's describing his body in a certain sense as being his competitor. And he's saying, if my body tries to get up, I knock it back down. Why? Because I don't want to be disqualified. I want to win. And of course, he's talking about the prize of heaven. No wonder then that in the next chapter, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. <clears throat> now, I probably take this to an extreme. Uh, if I climb a ladder, uh, I virtually tie myself to the top before I'll do anything. <laughs> because because uh, I don't want to think I'm standing and fall. <laughs> I, I have an aversion to falling from you know, anything higher than, than my head. <laughs> you know, and you may not have that aversion, but I do. You know, so I'm very, very careful. But, but brethren, think about it. Think of these standards. That kind of sounds like the Pharisees to me, does it you? Are we kind of a little bit back on those fellows in a sense of the word? I think we are. That self-righteous individual who thinks, I've arrived. I am there. Well, you better look out because the Israelites had arrived. They were God's people, chosen people. They were delivered from Egyptian bondage. But how did it work out for them? Well, for the best part of them, not well at all because they didn't remain true. They didn't remain faithful. Great warning for us is found there. But not only does the Lord say, consider self first. He says, compassion for the weak is essential. So listen to him in verse 5. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I don't want us to misunderstand. Yeah, I may have a big problem in my life I need to deal with first. But if my brother has a little problem and I can help him with it, then I should do that. I ought to help him. We're all in this together. Brethren, we are a family. One of these days, I'm going to figure out how to really, uh, all of us just sit and, and talk and relate to that idea. That we're a family. We're the family of God. And as family, we all look out for each other. I've, uh, I've kind of enjoyed their, uh, well, I'll just say it's Tracy's boys. And I'll tell you why. I especially appreciate them. Because if Rosie is going to be somewhere, those boys are going to be, they're going to be with her protecting her. I've seen it. They're going to be there. That's family. But this is a spiritual family, right? If one of us is struggling, one of us going through a difficult time, the rest of us need to be alert. We need to be there. Listen to Paul in Galatians chapter 6 when he says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, without a show of hands, but I think we'd get every hand in the house, well, except maybe a baby or two, but, but everybody else's hands. Have you ever been overtaken in the fall? My hand would go up. Absolutely. You ever struggle with something? Absolutely. It's, it's just part of life. We do. So knowing that, I can assure you that everybody in here, at one time or another, is going to need help. And we're talking now about spiritual help. We're talking about getting over a great spiritual struggle in life. Who's supposed to take care of that? Listen to Paul. The ones who are spiritual. If I have a lack of regard, a lack of concern 
for my brother in Christ, then could you conclude from this that I'm not spiritual? I think it's a pretty real possibility. I think it's something we've got to consider. The spiritual man is compassionate toward his brother. Caring, ready to provide at a moment's notice. James talks about it in James chapter 5, and I love the, the end of his book because it really highlights uh, this marvelous relationship. Here's what he says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Well, we're not talking there about you covering your own sins. We're talking about you helping the other fellow cover his own, his sins. You save a soul from death and help him cover his sins up so that he is able to uh, stand before God. True. Now, how's that going to be accomplished? Doesn't James deal with it earlier in the chapter? Don't you think? When he says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Confess your faults. When I was a young preacher, I, I did something that now I realize was totally crazy. I took on trying to help three alcoholics all at the same time. Everyone a member of the church. You might say, yeah, I didn't think we had that problem. Oh, yeah, we got lots of problems in the church. We're people. We're going to have problems in the church. You, you can guarantee it. Two of those alcoholics were married to each other. If I wasn't crazy for taking on three, I was, I was crazy for taking on two married to each other. Because that's what's known as a double codependent relationship. One of them gets sober, the other one's got to get drunk because they can't live with each other unless somebody needs help. I was spending 25 hours a week counseling alcoholics. It's not easy to do. You know what I found out? Till they recognize they got a problem, you got no hope. Ye with your spiritual restore such a one. What's probably the first thing you're gonna have to do? You're gonna have to somehow try to help them see they've got a problem. They're in trouble spiritually. And it's liable to cost them their souls. It's a very difficult thing to do. But here's the thing. Paul gives the extra part of that right next in Galatians 6. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You really want to help an alcoholic? Walk up to him and say, you ever get tempted to take a drink, call me. I'll be there. I'll help you. We'll just sit together until we get through it. Whatever's making you go there. That's compassion. Just got a letter a few days ago from a brother, dear, dear brother. Uh, he had somehow just lately had discovered where we are. It had been a long time since he and his wife had known where we were, nor, or we, they, they, for that matter. And he said, basically, he said, uh, we're, uh, we're writing to you not as people who just sympathize with you, but we empathize with you. And he began to explain that uh, his wife, a dear, again, a dear friend, had been diagnosed with a, a bad cancer. She spent a hundred hours in chemo. Uh, she was 
quite debilitated after it was done. They tried to give her therapy to help her recover. Uh, but she now is only able to take therapy in bed. She can't get out of bed. He said, so we're reaching out to you to tell you. We feel with you. We understand. And, and we want you to know we, we still love you and care for you. It's pretty meaningful to get that kind of letter. Can you help somebody here? Remember the church? Have you maybe had the same struggle they've got? Compassion. Very, very important. Very important. And I think Jesus is highlighting that here, this compassion for the weak that we need to have. Uh, I don't have it in, in the notes, but we want to look briefly at Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul uh, writes about this matter at the very end of the chapter. Uh, as he's writing those brethren to Ephesus, he loved that church. By the way, Ephesus uh, became uh, the the largest church in the first century, as far as we know. You might have said Jerusalem, uh, not by the late first century. You might have said Rome. Well, Rome didn't compete uh, with Ephesus. Ephesus was, the, at one point, almost the center of, of Christianity because of how grew, large it grew to be. Uh, a lot of time spent with Ephesus. Paul spent time there. But uh, Timothy uh, had that as his primary assignment. He spends a lot of time there. Uh, and if you read both First and Second Timothy, you're going to discover interesting endings uh, where Paul talks about uh, his, his desires for you, and the word he uses is not singular, it's plural. He expects that Timothy's going to read these letters to the church at Ephesus. So I just want you to understand, he's got a great love for this church. So listen to what he says uh, in Ephesians 4.32. Well, let's pick up a little bit above that. Look at 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. By the way, do not grieve, literally translated, stop grieving him. Not, not don't start, it's stop. <laughs> You've already, you're already doing it. All right. They explain then, Paul. Well, he's going to. He says, uh, he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You must have had a problem with it, I'm assuming. So verse 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You all right, tender hearted. Original language is the word is splanch nidzamai. You do not need to remember that. Mom and dad paid thousands of dollars for me to learn that word. And uh, so I use it every now and then just so they get their money's worth. Uh, but what it means is literally move to the bowels, which sounds like, boy, that's kind of crude, you know. What do you mean move to the well the Greeks did not say that the heart was the center of the emotion like we do. They said the bowels were. Now, I remember, and I bet some of you can parallel this in your own lives, different experience. I remember my mother one day accidentally dropping a Coke bottle. And believe me, we didn't have many, but they were glass. And she dropped it and it hit right on the the bottom edge on, on, on the front edge of it, of the bottom. And that thing blew the top off it and cut her, cut her thumb. And, of course, you can imagine the body reacts to that. <laughs> A little bit of blood and stuff like that. My first response to that was to think, uh, wonder where I could go get sick. <laughs> <laughs> because my stomach was immediately impacted by that. But second response was, she needs help. And so I, I did that instead. But, but I point out the stomach plays in. Fellas, when you, when you went to ask you, that special woman if she'd marry you, did you have any butterflies in your stomach? Everybody except Malcolm 
Uh, there's no need for him to even answer. Uh, it, 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 would, it, would, it, would, it would be something I would not want to deal with tonight. <laughs> so, well, I did. I don't know about you, but I did, okay? Uh, that, there's the seed of the emotion. So I've sometimes laughingly said, and I may have probably have said it here, you may have heard me, I'm waiting for Willie Nelson's next greatest hit. Honey, you've captured my bowels. <laughs> because that's it. That's compassion. When you feel with somebody, that's compassion. That's what the Lord's pointing out. And then, He urges us to be cautious, to cautiously practice discerning judgment. The biggest accusation that I run into, and I'm saying some of you may report to me that somebody did this to you, it has happened to me too. Somebody will say, when you say, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, they'll say, you're judging me. Jesus said, don't judge. Well, first of all, Jesus said, don't condemn. Let's start there. Yes, I know the words translated judge in the, in the King James, in the New King James. I didn't check all the other translations. I know it's translated that way, but it'd be better translated condemn. Because that's what we're really talking about in that particular passage. But Jesus does say that we should judge uh, in point of fact. And I, I will skip briefly to verse 6 and read it again. Do not give what is holy to, do to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, how are you going to decide who's a dog? Well, you're going to have to do some judging, not condemning judgment. You're going to have to observe how the individual acts. By the way, read Paul in his epistles because he calls the Judaizing teachers who are insisting that Gentile Christians be circumcised, he calls them dogs. You can judge that. Because that's using discerning judgment. That's determining this individual is claiming to be something they are not. And so you get Jesus saying it this way, John 7, 24, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Okay, here's the problem with, with people. We judge folks by the way they look. You ever notice that? I can, I really remember, and I probably have told this in some classes at least, maybe from the pulpit, but we have a dear friend that owned the Ford dealership in Cookville, Tennessee. And he, he told me what happened one day at the Ford dealership. This fella pulled up an old pickup truck uh, with his overalls on and his country work boots with a little bit of mud on them. And uh, he just started looking around for trucks out on the lot. And you know how usually when you go in the parking lot, there's six salesmen that are out there to greet you? Nobody went out there except for this one new young salesman. He ran out there, started talking to the fella. And the next thing you knew, he came in and went straight to the owner's office. And he said, uh, 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 Mr. Bob, can we take cash? Inside the bib of those overalls, he had a wad of thousand dollar bills. Did he look like he had a wad of thousand dollar bills? No. He looked like he'd have a hard time buying a McDonald's $1 hamburger. In those days, you could do that, by the way. He looked like he'd have had a hard time doing it. But did he have a hard time? No. Not a bit. In Scripture, there's an illustration. Fits very easily. Samuel goes to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king. He sees Eliab, the firstborn. What does he think? This is the one. Big strapling, must have been just, you know, just the epitome of kingly appearance. Probably looked a little bit like Saul, if I had to guess, because Saul was that way, too. Lord, 
through it says to Samuel, the I don't I don't judge from outward appearance. I'm not interested in what the fellow looks like on the outside. He's interested in what he looks like on the inside. And if you go and read, research this this phrase in Scripture, a man after God's own heart. Who was that? It was David. Did he ever sin? Yep. Was he willing to repent of his sin in a heartbeat? Once he saw it, he repented of it. And he was willing to take his punishment. I, the, I know the Bathsheba incident is the first one that comes to mind, but, but the one that stands out to me is when he takes the census and, and then realizes what he did is wrong, and he's watching people die because of what he did. Of course, they also had their problems, if you read the whole text. But, but anyway, he's watching them die. And finally, he says, you know, don't, don't hurt these little sheep. Hurt. It's me. You know, d- take care of me. There's the heart that God's looking for right there. That's the kind of heart we need to have. So where are we going to learn righteous judgment? Psalm 119 Verse 172, my tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. We're going to find righteousness in the commandments of God. Now, I want to point out that both Jesus and the apostles actually used righteous judgment. Look at Matthew 21, starting verse 23, and listen to what it says. Now, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you'll tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men... We fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. Which, by the way, was a lie. <laughs> but nonetheless, he, listen to him. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Did he use discerning judgment? Yeah. He didn't ever answer the question. Did he? No. He discerned that they weren't really interested in the answer to the question. They were interested in trapping him. So he didn't answer. Now look at one more. Acts chapter 13. The Apostle Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia and had a great reception at the beginning in that place. But then uh, Luke gives us a a report uh, that goes a little bit the other way. So pick up, if you will, verses 45 and 46. But... When the Jews saw the multitudes and they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. You know what that word reject literally means? Thrust away. They judge that they thrust away the truth and we're not going to teach you anymore. That's discerning judgment. It's discerned based on what? Their actions. Their actions. You know, that's what it's all about. So, great lessons in this section on judge not, beginning with condemning others is wrong. Consider yourself first. Have compassion for the weak, that's essential. And then, cautiously use discerning judgment. Thank you.